Hi. Gay is not sin. And Jesus isn't asking the gay person to change and be straight. You might notice kind of a rainbow in the background here. <clears throat> kind of excited because uh, a week ago, as when I, well, actually just a couple of days ago, um, Supreme Court uh, uh, judged that uh, gays should be married in all 50 states and in all every place else, territories and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, that's pretty exciting. It's a little bit exciting for me too because back there in 1985 when I began doing TV program, uh, all the time before that I accepted Jesus back in January 74 and uh, at that time and I already had done a lot of reading and I, I knew quite a bit about the gay community around the world because there's uh, gay newspapers as it were you know decent regular old newspapers uh, and and various things flyers and stuff and all from all over the world and in the rudimentary days of uh, the internet, it was, it was kind of more like um, uh, BBSs and things like that. <laughs> Maybe some of you don't know what those are. They'll dial up places and they send packages out. To, and then they'll lay a certain time of day, you got packages back and you can look in there to see if you got any mail from. Anyway, that's back in the old days, and, and it was, uh, I ran a, a six-line BBS, uh, and it was actually called Gays for Jesus, that was before 1985. When I accepted Jesus, I already knew that because I am gay, and I know me, and I know the gay community, I've been out there, I love to dance, been out dancing a lot and and, uh, and I met people met my lover who first lover first person I ever met I, I stayed with for 10 years we lived together for 10 years and um, and I know how we lived he had three kids we went on vacation and everything I could not see the difference between our life and any other married couple's life out there you go to work you have your Types of entertainment, uh, you have your house and so forth, and and you love the person you're with, and and you're faithful to that person. And there was not so reality said, and I, I knew how I felt. And you listen to homophobes out there, and they try to say I'm feeling something different, I'm doing something different, I'm defying or whatever. I don't know, living in. in sin, less sensuous, high dog uh, behaviors and, and all that, you know, and it did not compute because these were not what happened because whatever the straight person did with their wives or husbands is what gay people do. And if you want to talk about promiscuity and all that kind of stuff and uh, you, you say, well, gays are out there in uh, restrooms and parks and behind every bush and and so forth. Well, you gotta look at it and know that straights every place they possibly can and everything. And it didn't make any difference. They're out there whittling Dixie or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, they're, they, some of them brag like crazy. And some people that we respect and honor and sports figures, they, they, they thousand sexual partners you know and somehow or another you want to say gays are the bad folk no 700 years ago the Catholic Church made a doctrine a very official type of doctrine against gays they wanted to figure out how to purge people in power that didn't agree with them and so they got this doctrine together now they can point a finger you're gay and so they um, got them out of power, just like we like to do. We like to find scandals today. Let's see how bad we... 
this was kind of interesting after they in those days purged people out of power time went on and it turned out a lot of times those people that didn't agree with them pointed fingers back to them and said you're gay so it backfired on them but in any way it took about a hundred years and the protestants adopted this anti-gay doctrine when christians came over here to america you know, we, the purest puritans you know, it started out with extremism in the idea of what people thought was moral and one of the things what history calls a heinous doctrine against gays I mean they were ex really bad in their condemnation of gays and the way they treated gays and you wonder why gays might go to the park might hide their identity as a gay person might not look for a monogamous relationship as such you know it it's is not a fun thing to think that you're going to get fired from your job just because you're gay if somebody found out or your family would disown you your church will kick you out and so a lot of gay people did what would can be considered sexually immoral now I come on TV and I say that yeah these are actual immoral immorality but there's something interesting God imputes things and he counts things as you know he counted the belief of Abraham as righteousness Abraham wasn't righteous, but God counted it as righteousness. Imputing is something that's done. So, I'm pretty much absolutely positive in my, well, since 1974, Walk with Christ. And before that, he was with me, even though I was an atheist. Um, I have so many things before I accepted Jesus that is... That was God, Jesus with me. That it's going to be counted as church sin. What the immorality that gays did in a literal sense, if straights did this, knowing that they should be monogamous relationship with their spouse. Um, and and they're trying to say that if gays do what straights do, being sexual immoral, then see how evil the gays are because they're committing these like, sexual immoral acts that get reported on. You don't report too much on the heterosexual sexual immorality because it's unknown, it's accepted. It used to be you worried about divorce and all that. Now, hmm, a divorced Christian is as accepted as any other Christian in Christendom. Used to be. No, no, no. There's lots of different things in heterosexual sex activities that are 100% accepted these days, where not that long ago it wasn't. And um, some people still want to fight it. You know, you're, there's always going to be groups of Christians that think they're holier than thou, and they will actually think that everything that moves is either Satan or sexual immoral. They want to always get these sex things in there. Who cares about corrupt government? Who cares about mass murdering and stuff like that? Who cares that it could be proven often that government leaders and so forth say a word and hundreds and thousands die? But sex? That's seems to be the epitome. Well, sometimes they use it as a, the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and so forth. And so that means the Holy Spirit resides inside you. And we got lots of scripture. And to try to base it on a scripture, it's Jesus that comes into your heart. So he's, God writes his law on the tablets of the flesh. We're temples of the Holy Spirit. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's a lot. So we got lots of, there's lots of Bible if you want to try to start 
pointing the finger at a verse. The Bible, it's only a, a book like that, but so much is in that book. And you, you need to understand, you gotta look at it and understand it. There's no, 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 siren in the background here. You gotta keep in mind there's more to God than you point the finger at somebody. Unless you walk in the shoes of that person, it's very difficult for you to stand up and judge that person. You see something somebody's doing, you just got to keep in mind, you know, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, yesterday, we did things that today we think is the most terrible thing in the world. But now, we accept it as though it's God. We like to say, marriage is of God, and we have our definition of marriage. But the Bible has another definition of marriage than what you say. We get married paganishly. 12th century brought so many Christians in from pagan cultures that, that our marriage today, though we think it or, its origin is in Christianity and the Bible, it is actually from fertility cults, from, from the, the gods of the Roman Empire and, and uh, Europe area at those days. Uh, especially around the 12th century. Our receptions afterwards, our marriage vows, our, our going there before the, the priest, pastor, whatever. These are pagan. We gave them Christian names. And we only think of them in the thought that it is in God. God is a, in... And God is. You see, God isn't sitting there with a gavel out of line, out of line, sin, sin, to every kind of act that we do regarding this marriage thing. In the beginning, siblings could get married. Then you married cousins, then distance cousins, but you had to be in the same tribe. And now Israel's all scattered every place else. They don't know who they're marrying. Sometimes they do, but mo mo a lot of time, you know, Christian, uh, Jew Jewish people all over the world, they just, you know, they're mixed with everybody else. Catholics, Protestants, uh, unbelievers, other religions and everything. They, they're just mixing in quite a bit. And there's some that try the best they can to stay within their tribe, as it were, or otherwise at least another Jewish person or that the, whoever they marry will come over to Judaism or something and so forth. It's a complex world out there. It's also a complex world up there. We have all manner of things that has happened in the past that brings us to today to get ready for the Jesus' return. Now, when I accepted Jesus, like I said, 1974 and 1985, my belief was that it's too huge. There's no way you're going to get the church to think gay is not sin, let alone that gays will be getting married. It's just absolutely not a process of thinking and so when I was talking to God about it you know I did the research God is true so you can't have God against something that is true one plus one except when you're doing this new math is gonna be two when you breathe in you know that you're getting this oxygen amongst other things but that oxygen is keeping you alive amongst other things, but there's some things that we know for absolute. And there's, so my concept at that time was it's absolutely not sin because I've read the verses and I researched the verses and the words, the Hebrew, the Greek, and the ancient times. I know what they meant. I know what 
Abraham was doing. I know what Moses was doing. I know what Paul was doing and all these things in the culture around there of the days. I know what, when Paul was writing the book of Romans in Corinth, what, what he saw. He saw the temple of Apollo. He saw the temple of Aphrodite. There were 400,000 in the city, a seaport. People came in and they did all kinds of stuff like that. And prostitutes abound. Sacred prostitutes abound there. I know what these things are. I, but still, Christianity is too big. They have too strong a belief against gays. Yeah, how can it change? Well, in 1985, God showed me He isn't going to come back until that changed. The United States and generally the world is going to accept, G uh, accept gays. And one of the most significant possibilities of seeing accepting gays would be gay marriage. And so, from 1985, my preaching began saying, you won't have the rapture until the church and the country, as it was, accepts gay people. So basically, the found, fundamental foundation of seeing this accepted would be that gays can get married just like anybody else, like heterosexuals. And that's, at that time, it was like zero percent. And they had constitutional laws, basically, or stuff that was kind of set up in state laws that, that said it's absolutely against the law, period. The whole state says it can't ever happen. Well, but God told me it would happen. And so I kept preaching along those lines because somehow or another it might take, I kind of thought it's going to take the two witnesses during the first part of the tribulation, 1260 days, to come through with the message and events because they're going to bring all manner of plague and, and Antichrist kingdom and the church. I kind of get a good share of both. The church isn't ready. They don't have their wedding gown on. Well, you don't get your wedding gown on until you actually are raptured or you actually rage from that. It's like your wedding gown is sitting above you and you need to be able to slip into it. So when the rapture happens, you're, before you leave ground, you slide into your wedding gown. When the dead rise first, they're starting to rise and they, they're sliding into their wedding gown. When you die, you're too fat. You're, you're messed up and everything. So in death's gate, you're cleaned of this. I always try to say it's false doctrine, hypocrisy, uh, uh, things like homophobia and uh, uh, traditions and various kinds of stuff that makes us kind of want to have our little specific belief. We got the southern states and all that that just got to think they're the most conservative, most perfect Christians that they are brought. Any other Christians not Christian. Oh, the blue Christians are not Christian. If you're, you have to be a red Christian, you know. And, um, the thing is, your, your sins are going to become white as snow. And so, something happens when you die and you go through death gates. When you die and you come back, you don't get to go through death gates. So you get to see all kind of manner of things. You come back and you preach it like it's gospel. And it's not gospel. Some things are pretty accurately, you get an idea, but it's not. You didn't go through death gate. You don't come back from death gate. So when you come back, you say all kinds of stuff that was mushy. But you often say it like, this is how it is. Now some things it is. God gives you a message, you've got to tell the message. But it's still, we're seeing through glass darkly. We weren't allowed to go through. We're seeing everybody in their old physical body like things. You know, if they're old, we see them old. If they're young, we see them young. If they're mm, any age between that, we go up there and there they are. Sometimes we see uh, our grandparents as, as in their 20s or something like that. Others see them as grandparents. I mean, it, you don't see when you die and come back what's really there. You see what you need to see for what you need to do at that particular time and come back and 
you know, ch li life is usually changed. You saw something, but you got to remember, you still got to use the Bible. You can't stop using the Bible because now you saw face to face. So you thought you saw some pretty fantastic things, but you didn't go through Death's Gate. Some people start seeing their life revealed to them and seeing how bad they were, and and it's got a dramatic effect on you. But you didn't go through there. You didn't. You're still not clean when you come back you're still holding false doctrines and Jesus isn't going to spend the time and tell you this is false, false doctrine this is false, false doctrine this is where you're a hypocrite this is where you're following tradition you know that's not what happens when you have near-death experience when you have near-death experience it's either you're seeing hell and you might get to see both are you seeing something pretty wonderful because the whole general idea you know it's, it's going to be a pretty nice situation when we get our spiritual bodies and everything so when we get a glimpse of it it's a glimpse the bible says we see a glimpse we see through a glass darkly so we're not going to see the true heaven until we're totally dead and go through death's gate or we're raptured where we get living so if you die you have that opportunity to get clean because it's guaranteed you're saved but if you're alive you can change your mind you can turn your backs on jesus so you need a period of time that you can make a good decision about Christ and get cleaned up so you can slide into your wedding gown. Jesus doesn't want to wait any longer. When it's time, the dead rise first and those of us that remain are caught up in the air. We're going to get married to Jesus. It's not a long, drawn out process. A few years down the line we'll get married. We go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I mean, we meet him in there, get our rewards out, and whoop, we go get married, and then we're eating at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then we're having a, a three-year period because we got to come back with them. Some people think, oh, you're gonna, the rapture is going to be at the end of the trip. Some think it's going to be at the beginning of the trip. We're going to find out. I say it's going to be in the mid-trib, plus a few days, up to 75 days. I think that you're going to have the opportunity to refuse the mark of the beast. And if you refuse it, you can live, maybe, if lucky, about 75 days. And then you, all means of you getting your food and stuff like that run out. And uh, you can't go and buy anything. It's going to be, you know, whatever. You, it, you're not going to be any cash. People say, oh, the barter system. No, 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 no. You people that believe in barter system, not going to work. When you do any type of transaction, you're going to have to produce what it is. You're going to have some sort of mark and how, how it's used and what other form it takes. It doesn't matter. You're going to have to use it like your credit card today. They can tick, check a box that says, don't accept. And you try to slash it anywhere, it won't accept you. you, you can, so whatever foods you might have, you can get by maybe up to towards 75 days. And if God didn't intervene, those days would be cut short. At least everybody would perish. So mid trib seems the way it is. That way Christians can get ready for that are alive, can get ready for the, their wedding gown. And what are we going to do? Well... We get some pretty good detail in books that aren't considered the Bible, but they're certainly old books. And lots of people used them as Bible for great lengths of time. And they're banned or something by the Catholics when they put the Bible together. As bad as the Catholics might seem to some, God used them because it was a perfect group to put together that book that we can confirm. And you should know that you got to have the right Bible. God doesn't need a million Bibles. Westcott and Hort gave you a million Bibles to choose from when they put their corrupt version to the official Church of England's Bible. And then later on, in the 1940s, all the modern versions began to come from those. 50 to 80,000 corruptions. You need to research and know what you're reading and com confirm everything by the Bible. It's about out of time now. When you get to heaven, and the new 
been reigning with Christ and even today and backwards in time there's a lot of things going on Enoch, Enoch wrote about some we got some that we can, that's in the Bible very little but we got an idea he got to heaven he got enough information back then he went to heaven state Enoch the book of Enoch gave more details and showed the various levels there's a, you can almost picture it. lots of planets out there and lots of levels of seats of, of powers principles and powers and everything uh, and the authority of it they have to travel to various things and bring this you know it's pretty complex up there in heaven and we don't even know the fraction of it if you don't know Jesus right now turn to him and say Jesus I believe you're the Son of God and that God rose you on the third day a simple prayer gets you saved now read the King James Bible ask Jesus to baptize your Holy Spirit that's in Acts chapter 2 it's really cool and neat and really close relationship much more with Jesus Christ you got a place of pain? We all kind of do. Find that spot right now. If you, if, you know, if you never thought about it, find anything that you think might. And put your hand there. If it's really serious, put your hand there. In the name of Jesus, be healed. See you next time.